uh, worship and praise the Lord. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with our lesson on tonight. And I'm going to ask, uh, I think Brother Emerson uh, is on the line. Brother Emerson, if you don't mind, can you open us up with a word of prayer? Brother Emerson Williams, if you're on the line, can you do that? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Father God, we come to you tonight. I just want to tell you thank you for watching us from this morning to this this day. We thank you, Father, for being the God that you are. We love you and we praise your name. Give us willing to do your word and be doers here. And help us with this Bible class at night. We can learn something and we can tell us from that. Pray for each one of the family on the line, our church members, the sick, and the McGree. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brother Emerson, for opening up the prayer. This evening. All right, let's jump into our lesson on tonight. Uh, last week we concluded this with looking with looking at chapter three uh, in Genesis, and we also uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, begin uh, dissecting the first four or five verses, I believe, of chapter four. Uh, can I get uh, maybe three, two or three individuals to uh, give us a recap of what we covered and discussed last week? Uh, any two or three individuals, please, ma'am, please, sir, just uh, help us to understand some of the things we covered last week. Any volunteers? Uh, Dolores Wright, I'll get you started. Uh, Thank we, you, talk, we talked about the um, fact that uh, Eve's <coughs> child would eventually uh, be in conflict with Satan's. Uh, it would bruise his head and one would bruise the heel. And then... Uh, Chapter 4 tells us that um, Eve had a son, and he was named Cain. And for a, a short time there, she thought perhaps that this was the uh, son that had been foreshadowed that would do Satan in. But in the meantime, she had a second son, Abel. And we talked about the five kinds of births. We said that the first birth was Adam, the rib birth was Eve, virgin birth was Christ, the physical birth was Cain and Abel, and then the spiritual birth is those of us who must be born again. So that's where we were concerned now with the conflict between Cain and Abel, their gift to God. All right. All right. Very good. Thank you there, Dr. Wright. Anyone else? Two more individuals? Can, can any other individuals add to what Dr. Wright has already shared? Yes, sir, Pastor. Uh, I'll add a little bit. Uh, Dr. Wright, I really uh, found on something that I had written down, but uh, I'm going to take, take it from where I had it. Uh, we also talked about uh, how God honored uh, one brother's giving over another brother. And uh, the statement you made is uh, our gifts, uh, the way we worship and give to God, uh, has an effect on the way we get, we be blessed or how God blesses us. Uh, because when we, when we worship Him in fullness or we bless Him, uh, like when we're paying, being obedient by paying our tithe and our, and our offering, it, that's how it affects us when we, uh, in other words, when we just take it lightly and just give what we want to give instead of what we should give or when we praise Him. Uh, with true heart, but just praising because, you know, I, I, I need to go to church or I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing church a favor. So uh, that was another thing that we discussed last week. All right. Thank you, Reverend Pullum. Great, great, uh, great stuff there. One more individual. Anybody else? Actually, well, we talked about uh, the fact that uh, Adam and Eve had sinned in the garden, and they wanted to cover themselves. They felt that they knew that they were naked, and I think we said that that they had there was some blood shed for the uh, oh. the clothing that was used, and that we are uh, in comparison are inadequate to cover our sins. Um, yeah. That Christ has come in this shedding of blood, the sacrifice. Uh, as they had blood was shed when they were covered, Christ came and shed blood to cover our sins and cover our nakedness. 
because we are inadequate to do it of ourselves. All right. Thank you, Sister Powell. Great, great stuff there. All right. I want to I wanna kind of pick up uh, where we left off in last week's lesson. That's, that's right around five and six. Because I want to begin this lesson on tonight by uh, stressing the fact of showing how this is a direct relation or this is a direct relation to worship. What Cain and Abel are doing in this particular passage of Scripture, they are actually coming before God to worship God. And as and, and you and I, all of us know that when we worship God, we come to God offering something up to God or giving God something. Worship has mm-hmm. everything with what you are giving God, what you are offering God. Now, think about this. Most people don't come to church for that reason. Most people come to church to worship God to see what they can get from the worship service. Wow. The Lord just dropped that in my spirit. When individuals come to worship, eight or nine times out of ten, they come to worship to get something. They want to get a sermon that blesses them. They want to get a message from the choir that blesses them. But worship is all about what we give to God, because giving is an act of worship. So what Cain and Abel are doing here in this particular passage of Scripture, chapter 4, they are worshiping, they are coming to God to worship God, which is why they are giving or bringing something to God. Now, as I was uh, preparing for the lesson on tonight, I wanted to kind of deal with initially, as we start this lesson, as to uh, some of the reasons God was pleased with Abel's offering, or why God accepted his offering versus Cain offering. Now, one of the first things that I want to share on tonight uh, it, it kind of goes back to Hebrews 11 and 4. I want to show you Hebrews 11 and 4 because it says something that is extremely important. In Hebrews 11 and 4, this is what the Bible says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gift see that? His gifts. And by it being dead yet speaking. So the first thing that I want to say as to why God accepted Abel's offering was because it was a faith offering. He gave it to God with faith. Whereas when you look at Cain's offering, it has nothing, nothing to say in the Bible or from a biblical perspective as it being a faith offering. So faith was one of the elements that God appreciated about Abel's offering. But there's something else about Abel's offering that caught God's attention. And that was the mere fact that it was an animal sacrifice. Now, why is that important? It's important because this is what God did for Adam and Eve. Remember in chapter 3, or I think it was chapter 3, maybe chapter 2, when we were studying about uh, the sin of Adam and Eve when they committed sin, what did that God do? God offered up a sacrifice for their sin to cover their nakedness. So when Adam sees that an animal sacrifice was used for their sin, guess what Abel sees? He hears about that, or he knows about that, so when he gets ready to offer up a sacrifice to God, he does what God does for Adam and Eve. He gives them an animal sacrifice, whereas Cain does not give an animal sacrifice. So I wanted to, I wanted to mention that because uh, many people fail to realize that what God was looking for was the shedding of blood, some type of animal sacrifice. So... Uh, God did not just accept and reject Cain's offering, but he accepted and rejected the man as well. This is extremely important because if God rejects us, if we are not in a right standing with God, if we are not at the right place in our life with God, whatever we give God, he rejects that as well as us as well. Because the text is clear that 
God did not just accept and reject the offering. He accepted and rejected the man or the person as well. So both Abel and his offering were accepted, and both Cain and his offering were accepted as well or rejected as well. So this is critical and important. I want to share this because it was the offering that made the man either acceptable or unacceptable. I want to say that again tonight. It was the offering and the mindset behind the offering that made the man either acceptable or unacceptable to God. So when you when you look at the Bible, when you read the Bible scripture, very clear about this. So this is what this passage is all about. It's the major lesson that worship or the worship of God, the false and true approach to God is behind the means and methods by which we give God and the heart behind it as well. Uh, because you see right there in Hebrews chapter 4, I wanted to show, I mean, chapter 11, verse number 4, that God said, the word of God says, by faith, Abel's offering uh, was a more excellent sacrifice. So, so again, what was the sacrifice? The sacrifice of an animal is life, is blood. So, so we ask the question, how did Abel know this? Why did Abel sacrifice an animal? And the answer is because his father, Adam, had taught him to approach God through the sacrifice of an animal. So when Adam sinned, God killed an animal, clothed Adam, and Adam with the skin. So by this very act, God taught Adam that sin causes death, that sin needed a a uh, sacrificial substitute. Uh, uh, so, so basically, this is why Abel presents a uh, animal sacrifice to God. Now, I want to show show you something else. When you get down to verse number six, because in verses five and six is where the tension, what I call the tension in the text, comes into play. Notice what happens with Cain. His whole demeanor. Changes. Now, uh, you may may have heard a song that says it's written all over your face. You you don't have to say a word. You can tell how people truly feel before they even utter a word because their countenance sometimes will change. That is what happened here in the text because in the verse number five it says Cain was very raw, upset, and his countenance or his He's upset with Abel, but watch this. He's also upset with God. This is what's amazing to me. I can understand him being upset with God, but this is his brother. And I have a problem when, when jealousy creeps in the thing. This is another sermon or lesson in itself. Jealousy now creeps in the family because he is now jealous of his own brother. And I believe that a lot of us have many testimonies as to how uh, jealousy can uh, uh, rear its ugly head in the family. And I want to kind of see what a few people have to say as it relates to this. And I'm going I'm to pick on Sister Gregory and Sister Brenda Newsom initially about how jealousy can be seen or felt among family members because here in the text, Cain and Abel, they are brothers, and yet jealous streets in. Sister Gregory, what's your thoughts on that? What's the Sister Gregory, are you there? Sister Gregory or Sister Brenda, either, either one of you ladies there? If not, uh, let me just poll some of the students on the line. Talk to talk, talk. Talk to us briefly. Anybody have any thoughts about jealousy among family members? Well, this is Aditra. Uh, jealousy can come in, it can creep in quite easily, especially when it comes to uh, inheritance. And we, we know that, you know, you see it all the time. We uh, have one who may think another is 
closer to the parents than they are, so they become jealous and they start to try to manipulate and scheme on the back end to, uh, uh, you know, get get more than their share of what the parents have to leave. So you you see that easily, and even um, even in a more innocent state, you see it between children, um, just you know, eight and seven years old. If they think that one child is getting more attention than the other child, you know, that may break out a little uh, squabble between those two children. So you you see that jealousy creeps in uh, even before we know it, but it, it's there, you know, because the, all, the other one is always seeming to be pitted against the other one. Mm, right. And that, that makes perfect sense. Sister uh, Gregory, are you there? You got any thoughts on that, Sister Brenda? I'm here, Pastor. This is Johnny Gregory. Okay. What's your thoughts on that? Well, basically, um, actually, you 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 covered a lot of um, things that Brenda and I had discussed, and we had a big discussion before we came on. But we talked about Cain and Abel, and that uh, Abel had not done anything to Cain, but Cain was jealous because of the way that God um, gave him more attention than he did. And we also talked about other um, other jealousy throughout the Bible. For instance, um, the lesson of Jacob and Esau and how parents can also, uh, you know, be the uh, cause of jealousy among siblings um, because um, in Jacob versus Esau, the father Isaac chose to bless Esau and um, Jacob's mother arranged um, you know, for Jacob to receive the blessing by deceit. So that's an um, example of family jealousy where the parents mm-hmm. cause a lot of the, a lot of the jealousy. And then, um, you know, in this case, the parents weren't very helpful because the brothers, you know, didn't get along. And then there is also the question, you know, the example of Joseph and his brothers. Right. And, and this thing, the parents were also, you know, the main cause of the jealousy. Um, you know, and jealousy uh, between Joseph and his brothers was caused by the father because the father favored one brother more than he did the other 11. So, um, and then there's also the story of the prodigal son. When the right. son returned home and the father, you know, glorified him and gave him all these gifts and the older brother became jealous. Mm-hmm. Um, and the father had to remind the older brother that he already had everything. You know, but the most intriguing story of family jealousy that kind of threw me was um, the story of Rachel and Leah. Okay. Um, uh, You know, um, among, uh, uh, okay, where Joseph was in love, I'm sorry, with, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, with Rachel and Leah. Mm Mm-hmm. But um, jealousy, this jealousy was caused by the deceitfulness, deceitfulness of the father. And the jealousy among this two led to them allowing their maidservant to produce children by their husband. And this went on, you know, and because um, uh, the father, the husband favored one wife more than he did the other. But it was, the, it was because of the father that this happened because he deceived, um, you know, him into thinking that he was marrying one person when he was not married to another. So jealousy right. among family members and siblings goes way back. Mm, you are absolutely um, Yes, and my phone is back. Uh, something. Uh, and I don't know if you can hear me now, uh, Reverend Tobias. But anyway, okay, I need to... <laughs> okay we, we talked about the definition of meaning of jealousy, and it was one of the most painful and frustrating emotions deal with. It may not be our intention, but sometimes we are most jealous of the ones that we love at some point in our lives. And uh, when we uh, we may be jealous or envious for others, but it's when we start acting out the feelings we have. And sometimes right. our feelings uh, become unhealthy, they become dangerous. When we realize that our emotions are getting the best of us, that's what we need to try to uh, do something to uh, 
how to act those emotions, put those emotions aside, because there is never a reason for family uh, jealousy has no reason for family violence. There's no meaning to it, and, and there's, there's no useful purpose in it. And we see that happening over and over, all in our lives today. But um, yeah, hopefully, you, you, we yeah, need I to go and talk to somebody, or you know, to go and talk to somebody, or um, you gotta stay from that situation and move on. Now, okay. there's one thing I want to add to that, or just to tag along to that. You know, here in this particular passage of scripture, this jealousy shows up, and it's not because Abel did anything to his brother. Cain was merely jealous. Watch this, this is amazing because of Abel's relationship with God. And sometimes people will become jealous of other people, not because they do something to them, but because of their relationship with God. People will look at the life of some Christian, and they will say to themselves, I wish I had that relationship with God. And because they don't have that relationship with God, because God is not blessing them, the way he's blessing someone else, jealousy will rear its ugly head. So jealousy has showed up, and it's not because Abel has done anything wrong, but Cain is merely jealous of Abel's relationship with God. That's right. exactly we why. We don't want to get ahead of the story, but that's what it said, that he was jealous, but he was also mm -hmm. ashamed. You know, uh, uh, Cain... Uh, Abel by him, uh, when God rejected uh, Cain's offering, Abel saw him, and he became mm -hmm. ashamed. And so that really made him even more angry with the situation. Right. Right. Uh, exactly. So we, exactly. we don't want to hold up the whole time. <laughs> that's why. That's why it's but now, yes, ma'am, you had to talk there? No, I was just going to say, but in some cases when there's sibling jealousy, you know, family, uh, the brothers or sisters or sisters or brothers, whoever, you know, sometimes they come to some type of reconciliation, as in the case of Joseph and his brothers, they were able to, you know, come together. And also Jacob and Esau, they were able to get, you know, to, re um, to reconcile their jealousy and come back together. Right. And if you look at this particular passage of Scripture carefully, this is what God is doing or saying in the very next verse. In, very, in the very next, very next verse, verse number six, God is saying, okay, I know you're upset. I know you're bothered. I know you're jealous. I know you're angry. But God gives Cain an opportunity to rectify his attitude. Because God says, right there in verse number six, the Lord said to Cain, why are you upset? Why are you mad? Why is your countenance changed? If you do well, if you do what's expected of you, Shall you not be accepted? And if you do not do what's expected, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So God is literally giving Cain an opportunity right here in verse 6 and 7 to do what? Confess his sin, confess his attitude, confess or admit that he's done wrong, change his behavior, and God will smile on him or bless him the exact same way he did his brother. The same practice or principle applies today. There's no reason for anyone to be jealous of anybody else that God is blessing or God has accepted. Because God is literally saying that if that person follow in their footsteps, inquire about what they have done, then maybe God will accept them as well. Any thoughts of God? Well, that goes back to that uh, scripture, First Corinthians 13, 13, chapter 14, verse. Love is patient, love is kind. Uh, it's not uh, envy. That means it's not jealous. It does not boast, and it's not proud. Right, right. So, so, so this particular chapter has everything to do with our work, how we approach God, and even our mindset of motive in the church today. It has everything to do with worship or worship. Is God accepting your worship, accepting your praise, or is he rejecting it? Your praise 
and your worship because your motive and mindset has everything to do with it. Now, in verse number seven, it's an important part in this particular uh, pericope of scripture because God says, verse number seven, look at what he says. Thou doest what you have not thou be accepted. Thou doest not what sin lieth at the door. What, what, what is God really saying? He's using an analogy here. Does anyone have an idea of what God is really saying or the analogy he's using? I'm going to ask a preacher, Reverend. Reverend Pullen, you got in thoughts of Pastor Broom there. Some, some scholars find this verse difficult to understand, verse number seven. Any thoughts there? Anyone? Can I, can I read you about on it? Okay. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Hello? Yes, ma'am. So, Shin, we here. Okay, I was going to ask you, could I read what I found? The body said, if I came to Master's of Sin lurking at the interest of his desire, he would have to give up his jealous anger so that sin would not find a foothold in his life. Sin is still wow. quite... Sin is still crouching at our door today. Like Cain, we will be victims of sin if we do not master it. But we cannot master sin in our own strength. Instead, we must turn to God to receive faith for ourselves and faith and strength from other believers. The Holy Spirit will help us master sin. This will be a lifelong battle that will be over, that will not be over until we are face to face with Christ. Okay. Thank you, Sister Chan. I like that uh, that that reason or definition. There, were you about to say something, Reverend Pullen? No, Pastor, not, not not just yet, not just yet. Okay, were well, you going to add to verse number seven about being alive at the door? My my understanding uh, uh, to this particular uh, passage was when you're talking about seeing lying at the door is if if you do right. Uh, if if you if we do right, right follows right. When we do wrong, wrong follows wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. If 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 in other words, if, if when he says, if I do it well, shall I be not be accepted? We know that when we when we when we're doing right, well, especially when it comes to uh, how we love one another, uh, when we when we're not having that uh, that jealousy against one another, against our brother or our sister. Uh, we can we can count on God and seeing things do, going right in our life in, in a spiritual way like it's supposed to. But when we are not, we should expect. Uh, again, it says now, and if thou do it not well, sin lies at the door. You can look for it. To in, in other words, sometimes people say they know when you done, when you done did something wrong. You know if you're a Christian. You know what? I did something wrong. Now I got to wait on God. Oh, God going to get me for that. I'm going to have to pay for that one. And so uh, that, that was what uh, kind of what I understand it to be, uh, that saying, uh, Reverend Broome, let Reverend Broome take it, take it from on there. I know he got a little something to add to that. All right. Um, now, now, I want to show you what what I found in my study. When, when, when the scripture or the Bible uses this analogy, sin lieth at the door. Is really uh, painting a picture in the Hebrew language of a bear or an aggressive animal just lying at the door waiting for someone to open it. It's really a quite awful picture if you really uh, put it in your mind. Imagine a lion or just sitting at your door. And as soon as you open that door or make a crack in that door, that animal just rushes in to attack you. This is what God is, or the analogy that he's using, that sin is just that sneaky and powerful, waiting for you to crack the door so that you, so he can run in and attack and, and, and devour you and try to kill you. So God is literally saying to Cain, he said, if you don't do what's right, sin is lying at the door waiting for the opportunity to sneak in to grab hold of your life. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And the thing yep. you know, is, is surrounding us today. Sin yep. literally lies at the door, waiting for the opportunity to slip in. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
And that's, and that's, a, that's exactly what happened. Uh, uh, men was waiting, and in the first eight, yeah. men and eight were talking. Probably one of them got overheated there, I guess. <laughs> they had a chance to come together during this conversation here. But then, okay. uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, evil had taken over. And exactly. they came and slew Abel during that conversation. They could have made up, but they didn't. The exactly. conversation didn't go that way. You're exactly right. You uh, so much evilness? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's why it says that we can't do this on our own. We have to have the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. We have to ask for faith to, to see us through this. Because you just can't yeah. do it by yourself. It cannot be done. So so we see here uh, uh, numerous of things. We see here, now we have the very first murder in Scripture. But I want to show you all something also that you may have omitted or did not see in this text. In verse number seven, you have the first mention of the word sin. That's right. I was going to say that, Pastor, but you got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you noticed that as well? Yes. I, I, in my studies, I had uh, I read it. I noticed it, 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 it was telling me that sin is, uh, the word sin appears in the Bible over 4,000 times, but the very first time you see sin is in chapter 7, uh, between, uh, 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 between the two brothers of the two, of the mother, and the first the first man and the first woman that actually committed, but you don't see the word until the brothers actually, to the brother actually commits uh, the sin to the brothers. Right. Now, prior to chapter 4, Sin was committed when Adam and Eve uh, transgressed there in the garden. But the first right. mention of the word sin is right here in chapter 4, verse number 7. Yes, sir. Yes. If to do it well, then sin lies at the door. This is where we get the definition of sin. If you look at this word sin, sin means what? To miss the mark. And what Cain has done, he has missed the mark as to God's expectation of worship. Wow. That's what sin means to miss the mark. God has certain expectations for us. And when we don't meet those expectations, guess what? We miss the mark, which means we have fallen victim to sin. So right here in verse number seven, you find the first word, first time the word sin is actually mentioned. All right. When you get down to verse 8, now the actual murder of Abel takes place. Now, what's amazing is, <laughs> you know, when you look at this particular passage of Scripture, what precedes uh, uh, the, the actual act? What precedes that is a conversation. Or literally, talk in the field. You see it right there in verse number uh, I believe it's eight. It says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. It came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and he slew him. Now, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, meat in the first. Uh, so literally here, it shows the one thing that one of the commentaries that I really think, and it kind of caused me to look at this particular, um, uh, thought somewhat different. You have here the righteous being persecuted. And you see that throughout the scripture, throughout the Bible. Here's the first case of religious persecution. The unrighteous attack the right. The unholy attack the holy. And one of the things that we see in the this past scripture is just because you are righteous, just because you are holy, that does not necessarily mean that we're going to experience blessings all the time and even long life or long gym. Uh So our attitude toward uh, uh, the life of Cain and Abel can be seen in this fight. Because one thing that I've noticed is that God
God is more so concerned not with how long we live, which is going to bless you. God is not concerned about how long we live. You know what God is concerned about? He's more co- so concerned about how holy we live. Lord, have mercy, Jesus. God is not so much concerned with how long our life is, because you'll see that Abel did not live a long life, but he did live a holy life. That's what matters to God is how holy our life is. Not how long our life is, because you will see that Cain lived a very long time. And I'll come back to that later on in this lesson, but I want to see if there are any thoughts or comments as to that uh, about God being more concerned with how holy our life is more so than how long our life is. Any thoughts or comments there? Any thoughts, any questions, coming? So you see here that this is the first case of those, of, of one who is religious or righteous actually being attacked in the field. Cain talked with his brother in the field, and then he rose up, slew him, and killed his brother. The very first act of murder, which is premeditated murder because he led him to the field with the intention of taking his life. Now, another thing that's interesting in this particular passage of Scripture is, when you look at the curse of Cain, it's amazing to me how some individuals feel as though they should have a path. Lord have mercy, Jesus. Feel as though they should have a path when they transgress against their brothers or sisters or when they sin against God. This is the mindset of Cain in this particular passage of Scripture. This man killed his brother, but then has the nerve to say he feels as though his punishment is too great. Lord, have mercy to you. Any thoughts are coming there? How can one commit sin, transgress against God, but then have an arrogant attitude that makes them feel as though they don't deserve to be punished? Wow. Any thoughts or comments on that? Well, Pastor, this is just very, and as I was reading the scripture, it kind of let me know that. I can't do anything to you without hurting myself. So, you know, a lot of times people don't think about the consequences. They just want to get revenge or do something to hurt you. But, in, you know, it's a, it's twofold there. When you hurt somebody, you also hurt yourself. Wow. Yeah. You're exactly right. Thank you, Sister Bear, for that comment. Any other uh, comments as it relates to that? Yeah. 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 He says in, in verse, um, what is it, uh, he said something about, you, you're punishing me, and, and I don't know why you're doing this. 13, he says unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And he's mm-hmm. killed his brother, but the punishment that God has given to him, he's complaining that it's more than he can bear. He's being treated unfairly. Right, exactly. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Heard another comment as well. Well, Pastor Bias, this, this is uh, Sister Burns. I think also uh, in regard to society, you know, when when people commit crimes and and those who are on death row, uh, you know, there are people that uh, go, uh, you know, they they go for them to to prevent them from being. Uh, uh, executed or whatever, but uh, I heard uh, one one uh, pastor was saying that 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 uh, capital punishment is not is is just for a person that has done uh, you know that has killed somebody because that is what you know that's what the Bible says. I, I had not mm-hmm. found that, but uh, that 
Uh, that that's what that's what was said. So I think sometimes society is, is kind of like the person, you know, talking about, you know, this is too much for me, um, you know, to, to have this capital punishment on me. Wow. And you're right, Sister Bro. And the point I want to stress or make here is God has the right. And this is why this is why I'm so passionate about worshiping God the right way with what we do, what we give, what we say. This is why worshiping God the right way is so important because God has the right. Lord have mercy. He has the right to punish us however he sees fit. Lord have mercy, Jesus. With no justification to anyone. This is what he does to Cain. But yet you will see in his punishment, he still exercises a certain level of grace. And we're going to get to that shortly. Look at what he says in verse number nine. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? God is literally questioning Cain. Now this question is not uh, as a means of gaining information because God already knows. He asks this question not as a means of uh, information but revelation. He's trying to get Cain to think about what he's done and to possibly confess to God. The Lord says to Cain, where's your brother? And he says, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? This is a very sarcastic comment. This just goes to show you how sin will get in your head, in your mind, and cause you to say and, and, and behave in manners that are completely ungodly. How in the world, or, or why in the world, is he even being sarcastic in this manner? He says, am I my brother's keeper? God said to him, what has thou done? The voice of thy brother crieth from unto me from the God. What, what is God saying there when he says the voice? of Abel is crying from the ground. This, this is another particular passage of scripture that uh, a lot of people have struggled with interpreting as to what God means when he says, the voice of thy brother crieth unto uh, to me from the ground. Any thoughts here, Mr. Nietzsche, Ms. I, Ms. Out of there, what, what what is God saying there? Okay, so God is saying here, and this I do want to say this, this whole chapter, Genesis 4, is really, really intriguing for me because uh, nothing is created by man. Because this whole chapter represents nothing but poetic language, figurative language, and full of just right. metaphors in which God has created, which uh, is something that I've, I've taught over the years. So that's just amazing for me. But anyway, so obviously... God is using figurative language here when he says that uh, Abel's blood is crying out to him. Blood can't talk, so he means something else. So the Bible tells us or shows us that blood is sacred in, in the eyes of God. So the blood represents the life, and life is very precious to God. So Abel's blood represents his life. So when Cain killed Abel, he took his life away. God is the creator, and therefore he He's a giver of life, and when a life is taken away, he knows about it immediately, and he cares, and this hurts him. And right. that's what I got from that. Okay, okay, all that's good, absolutely correct. Miss Barry, did you have a thought on that as well? Well, yes, and I do agree with what she said, and what I got here is that the blood crying is a symbol of the soul crying for its right to live. And in this instance, the cry was a demand for the punishment of the murderer. Now, uh, there were two references that they sent me to, and that was Hebrews 12 and 24. And I'm going to read mm -hmm. this from the uh, 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 Life Application Bible, which it brings it to life. It says, mm -hmm. you have come to the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people and to the sprinkled, sprinkled blood which grace, graciously forgive instead of crying out for vengeance as the blood of Abel did. Also, it sent me to Revelation uh, 6 and 10, and I'm still reading from the Life Application Bible. 
and it said, they called loudly to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? And uh, when will you avenge our blood against these people? So this is the, you know, symbolic of, of, of the dead crying out to God for those things, uh, well, for them being murdered by uh, other men. So they want okay. justice too. Okay, okay, great, great talk. And, and that's absolutely correct as well. And again, there's a lot of figurative language here because as Ms. Janitra said, blood cannot cry out from the ground. What God, one of the important messages that God is saying here is that sin cannot be silent. Wow. God cares about mankind so much that when individuals have been done wrong, when individuals have been murdered, killed for whatever reason, God is using a figurative language here that says the sin that others commit in taking innocent life cannot be silent because what it does is it makes a noise that God hears. This is extremely deep. Sin may be kept quiet on our end from mankind, but we can rest assured knowing that God hears the cry that comes out when innocent blood has been shed. This is amazing. Because if you remember or read in Genesis, I think, chapter 18 through 20, when when when, when all the sin was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah, what did the Bible say? It said the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. God heard the sin cry, and all of the sin that was going on, God heard it. Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that the Bible says, God says, I have heard their cry. In other words, the blood of Abel was crying out from the, from the ground, uh, his innocent blood, his, his, his innocent blood, because he had done no wrong, that it grieved God, it bothered God. Can you imagine how much sin today is crying out to God that he's aware of, that he is grieved by? This is the very reason, I hate to jump ahead, but you're going to see this is the very reason why in the next few chapters that God wipes out the entire earth because of the sin that is crying out from the ground. Wow. Thoughts are coming. Uh, another thing about that blood and the sin is that blood represents life. If blood right. is removed, if blood is removed, is removed from a living creature, it will die. Because God mm -hmm. created life, only God should take life away. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so, so that's why God is saying to to Cain that I can hear the blood of your brother crying unto me from the ground. Wow. So so now when you get to verse number 11, we're moving on. Uh, verse number 11, this is where God literally curses Cain. Now remember, in, in the other chapters, he cursed the serpent. Now you'll see a pattern here. He cursed the serpent. He cursed Adam. He cursed Eve. He cursed the ground. And now he's actually getting ready to curse Cain. What can we see when it comes to sin? Lord have mercy. Sin is always followed with some form of punishment or curse. I don't care what it is. This is a hard pill to swallow. But there is always some form of consequence and punishment that's going to come from sin. That is, that is, that as, as you see, uh, this these chapters building up, building up. You you see the sequence. You see everything unfolding around the actions of mankind. Serpent was cursed. Adam was cursed. Eve was cursed. Now Cain is getting to the point where God is going to curse him as well. Now the interesting thing is. When God curses you, Lord have mercy. 
that curse can only be broken by God. Wow. Now, I got some individuals who are going to talk some about this curse, and I want to hear what they say. Because uh, in verse number 11, let me read it to you. He says to Cain, you are cursed from the ground, the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When you till it the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. What in the world does God mean when he says a fugitive and a vagabond will you be on the earth? Let's see, uh, Sister Peggy, if you are there, uh, I want to hear what Sister Peggy Jennings uh, is going to say about this, and Sister Sophia Johnson. What, 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 what are you all thoughts upon this curse? Hello, how's everybody doing? We're doing well. Good to hear your voice. Good, good. Thank you, sir. So, um, verse 11 reminds me of um, a sermon that I heard regarding anger being caused by your own shortcomings. So, using this um, passage as an example, when Adam and Eve brought into the world their first two sons, Cain and Abel. Anger started at the altar, at the offering table. It was a time for giving. So Cain bought his gift, like you said, Pastor, and Abel bought his gift. God looked at the two brothers' gifts. He rejected both Cain and his offering, but he had God had respect for Abel and his faith offering. So Cain got angry with his brother, like we've already mentioned, killed his brother because of Abel's relationship with God. Um, when, when really all Abel was trying to do was what he thought was right, was bringing his offering. It was God who was the determining factor. But Cain got angry with Abel, killed his brother, out of anger, he was cursed with, number one, with the reduced productivity. Number two, he was cursed with non-acceptance. So God yeah. said to Cain in verses 10 through 12, and I'm going to paraphrase it, you put your brother's blood in the mouth of the earth. Therefore, yeah. the earth will not give you back full strength. So when you go back to till the, t the soil, the earth will not give you back the full strength. So not only is the earth going to deny you a full productivity, but you're not going to be accepted as you go to and fro. You're going to be like a vagabond, a fugitive. Everywhere you go, people are going to reject you, and you're going to have to move on. Now, wow. God said right here, he said, in an essence, he was saying, while you're angry at somebody because they were able to do something that was blessed by God, you're angry with them, and that reduces your own ability to produce. Okay. You can never do your best while you're busy being jealous and angry with what somebody else doing. The other curse, which is the non-acceptance, instead of improving his position with God and confessing and, and giving himself the opportunity to be forgiven, Cain had no remorse for what he had done. His focus was on his own fears of having to look over his shoulder to see whether or not someone was going to kill him like he did his brother. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, so, thank you. Oh, yeah. Miss yeah. Sophia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, talk to us. You're talking on that. Well, she basically touched on everything I had. Well, that um, when he was able, he wasn't going to be able to perform any uh, farming. He, he was going to be a cast out. It's out in an unstable man. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. 
Thank you, ladies, so much for that. Now, it's a it's a di- direct correlation with with the ground here. Uh, you can see this in this particular passage of scripture. Remember, God says earlier, the voice of the blood of thy brother, the voice of the blood of thy brother. I'm paraphrasing it. Crieth out to me from the ground. Now again, God uses the ground again as a form of punishment. There's no coincidence there. Because the interesting thing is his curse is literally, uh, and he considers it a a heavy or tough sentence. Uh, He he literally says here that numerous things are going to take place. You're going to be a fugitive, a vagabond. And and what this saying is that sin always brings a curse upon our life. Sin always brings a curse on life the sinner. From the earth, he says, this mean king will be removed from bearable, favorable, let me say it that way. Uh, He would be moved from favorable farmland where he could uh, ground, would be hard for him to till and the form. The land will be poor. I think we've already heard that. That Cain would form in the future. It would be horrible land. Uh, And this is tied to the first curse that God gave Adam and Eve as well. Now, when he says a fugitive and a vagabond, Cain would literally have no settled home. Now, think about it in this life. All of this, again, is symbolism as to how sin affects human beings. Cain would have no settled home, but he would always be moving around from place to place. The word fugitive involves fear. Cain would not enjoy life in the future because that's what sin does. Sin produces fear. He will always be, watch this, always be paranoid and always looking over his shoulder. This is amazing. And Cain has the audacity to say that this punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, one of the things, and I want to kind of uh, move around a little bit because I want to see what you all going to say in this last two or three minutes. There, there, there's been some speculation as to how long Cain lived and what happened to him. Does anybody have any idea how long Cain lived and what happened to him? He got to be 950 years old. All right. So Taylor said 950 years old. Uh, can you show us so that what the scripture 30 years. 730 years. Okay, somebody says 730 years. Can, can either one of y'all show us that inscription? Where is that found? I have to show that next time. I don't have it right before me. But I do read that. Okay, all right. And I heard somebody say 730 years. Anybody? Is there a scripture to back that up? I don't have a scripture. Okay, okay. All right. Anybody know how he died or what happened to him? Well, that, that's yeah. number eight. Great, 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 I'm moving along. I'm just skipping around as it comes up. Can you uh, you can go ahead and answer that question if you like. How did Cain die? <clears throat> oh, okay, I'll answer. Uh, okay. Our scripture does not say how Cain died, but I am assuming, I'm assuming that he died a natural death. But there are several wow. fictional interpretations of how he died. Okay. One one says that his grandson Lamech, they had put a mark on Cain. And okay. This, this, this fable says this, this mark was a horn sticking out of the front of Cain's head. And Lamech's okay. grandson was uh, out hunting, and he was blind, but he saw this horn, and he shot. He didn't know it was Cain, but he shot at this horn because he thought it was an animal. Mm-hmm. That's one fictitious story. And another fictitious 
story is that uh, Cain was killed by a stone. A house fell on him. And it, 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 it uh, related this stone to, because Cain killed Abel with a stone. And they, they this fictitious story that uh, the stone, the house fell on Cain and killed him. Okay. Okay. No scripture reference to how came that. Okay. All right. So, so, and, and that's why I wanted to use the scripture as a reference. I think we have five more minutes. I'm trying to answer these other questions. Scripture does not tell us exactly how he died, but there are various interpretations uh, in this chapter that 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 make suggest that he was killed also by another family member. And I'm going to read that scripture real quickly uh, in a moment here. But before he died, I, I really can't answer the question why God protected him. But, but well, I do have an answer to it, but I want to see what you all are going to say before, before I give my two cents. Before he died, God decided to protect him, to give him longevity of life for a certain reason. Uh, uh, and he actually protected Cain because we also see this is why God is so amazing to me. Because even in Cain doing wrong, for whatever reason, God decided to protect him and he put a mark on him. Uh, so Deborah, any thoughts on how he protected him prior to his death? Yes, sir. Uh, he protected uh, Cain by putting that uh, a mark on a mark on him or a sign. No one knows for sure what that sign was. I know Miss Taylor said it was something about some horns. I don't know, but I had researched it, and they just said that they never, you know, it was never said what that sign was. But it okay. was, and uh, it was a mark of God's protection, and but it was not a curse. So whoever uh, came upon Cain. You know, they would not kill him. Uh, the mm -hmm. curse of punishment was his in, in Nod. And the mark okay. was a sign of God. And also the mark God put on Cain was placed only on Cain. And there's no reason to believe that Cain's descendants would have inherited the mark in the form of darker skin color. Okay, okay. Great thought. And, and some would say... Uh, I heard that uh, uh, that thought to Taylor mentioned that it was a horn, but other scholars believe that it was possibly a tattoo. So there are many thoughts as to what that mark could have been. It could have been a horn on his head, or either a tattoo on his head. But 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 the point of the matter is, for whatever reason, God decided to protect Cain uh, uh, for for a brief period of time. And that was I, God's you know, I, just, I didn't think God was doing it to protect Cain. I thought he was doing it to, to make him miserable. Because, you know, that's okay. how you say, you don't, you don't want somebody to be executed right away if they've done some horrible thing. Let them have life imprisonment so they can suffer for 30-some years. And I think that's okay. what, I thought that was what God was doing. Because Cain was afraid that somebody was going to kill him. God said, no, I'm going to fix it so nobody kills you. But you still will be a vagabond and a fugitive, but nobody's going to kill you and get you out of your misery. Because exactly. And when you look at verse 14, it says, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is great that I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day. Uh, verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So that could have been a form of, of punishment so that he could live a long, longer life uh, 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 producing and working in the field and not get any results from his land or uh, for whatever reason God chose to do that. But meanwhile, Cain has a family. He has a family. Now, yeah. Uh, scholars have also argued, and we're going to close on this tonight, where did his wife come from? Who did he marry? Uh, and that's where we're going to close our lesson tonight. Who did Cain marry and where did his wife come from? 
that's right. They say that he probably married one of his sisters because at that point in time, you know, there were just so many uh, people around, so they didn't, they didn't have to worry about marrying your sister and getting some terrible disease. So he could have married his sister or his niece because uh, Adam and Eve had plenty more children. Okay. Okay, well, uh, Pam, she can take off of what Dr. Knight said. Um, the short answer is that yes, obviously she was the daughter of Adam. Uh, she may have been Cain's sister, uh, his niece, or even the grandniece. But the Bible does not mention the name of Cain's wife. Uh, the only reference given to her is in Genesis 4 and 7, and it says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. That's the only reference that's given uh, in regards to his wife, and she is nameless in the Bible. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. So we don't have her name, but we do uh, uh, have reference that Adam and Eve had other children. I think mm -hmm. you, you'll see that in chapter 5, uh, right around verses uh, 1, 2, 3, or 4, somewhere up in that area. Uh, yes, yeah, I think in the opening part of chapter 5, you'll see uh, uh, it's discussed. It's uh, 4. Yeah, first of all. He had a okay, son yeah. named Seth. Exactly. All right. And he begat sons and daughters. It ends by saying he got Seth, right. and then he begat other sons and daughters. Exactly. So, so you see here this this chapter uh, four, and we're going to cl close with a word of prayer because uh, we have covered a lot of information on tonight in chapter four you'll see the lineage or line of Cain begins to grow, which is the ungodly line. So remember that as we move into chapter 5. This is now the ungodly line of Cain. He has children, and we'll see in the lesson next week. Any questions or comments from uh, 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 any of you before? Thank God for all of you, for each of you. I think we have uh, about 65 lines tied into the system on tonight. So we praise the Lord for all of our members and pictures who have called. Yeah. All right. Any comments? Pastor, can I just ask you this question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, in um, verse 13, and Cain said, oh Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And at this time, you know, uh, God changed it a little bit when he put this mark on it to keep him, anyone from killing him. Didn't he show him some mercy? He did. By doing... Yes, ma'am. I agree. He did because he could have killed him on the spot or taken his life. So that was a uh, degree of level or level of mercy extended to him because he uh, uh, could have taken his life as well. Exactly. And that's what's amazing about God. Even when we do wrong, God can still show us some form of grace and mercy. Amen. Thank you, Sister Barry, for bringing that point out as well. All right, we're getting ready to close in a word of prayer. Thank you all so much for uh, participating on tonight. Listen, it's going to get gooder and gooder because Chapter 5, as a stuff we're going to break down, and you'll see in Chapter 5 that's really going to blow your mind because what really messed me up or blessed me about this passage of Scripture is, is and I know it's so much in this text, one thing that you'll see in Chapter 4 is that Cain decided to leave the presence of God. God did not force him away. Much like in chapter 2 or 3, you'll see that God forced Adam and Eve out of the garden. But in chapter 4, even when Cain killed his brother, Cain left on his own from the presence of God. I want to show you that real quickly because that kind of uh, uh, caught my attention in chapter 4. And then I promise you we're going to be done and close in prayer. I think it's right around verse number uh, 16. 16. 16. 16. 
exactly. When you get down to verse number 16, look what it says. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. God did not, and that's what's amazing. He decided because of his sin and his arrogance that he did not even want to try to rectify his relationship with God. He says, okay, God has punched me, so I'm going to leave from the presence of the Lord. That That is what frustrates me the most is when an individual decides to leave the presence of the Lord. That's a frightening situation. Wow. That's a frightening situation. All right, I'm done. So that caught my attention uh, in the lesson on tonight. Pastor, this is Dr. Tanya. I just want to add to that. Remember, we had discussion of the meaning of going east, right? You know, the chairs were at the east, and we made the comment that east is going away from the presence of God. So we see that he went east of Eden, Mm. so he went away from the presence of God. We see that here, too. Yeah, and I I didn't even notice that. Great point, Dr. Tanya. Thank you for sharing that. All right. All right. We're we're done tonight. Please, ma'am, please, sir. Uh, don't forget to exercise your right to vote on tomorrow, an important election. But however the election unfolds or go, God is still in charge. And if he allows Trump to stay in office, I guarantee he allows it to happen for a reason. Mm-hmm. Amen. So, 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 so however the election goes, we're going to continue to put our faith and our trust in God. All right. Thank you all so much. And our visitors on the line. Would you all like to share anything? I thank God for our business because you don't have to call in. Uh, any thoughts coming from any of our visitors who are not members of New Mount Zion? If not, thank you so much. Dr. Sonia, since you were the last one to speak, would you be willing to close us in prayer on tonight, please, ma'am? Sure. May we pray. Thank you. Our Father, God, we just love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory, and we thank you for this opportunity for us to come together, fellowship, learn, study, and and just be immersed in your word, giving us the opportunity to grow spiritually, Lord, to grow in our relationship with you, and to grow grow in our relationship as a church family. Lord, we ask that you forgive us our sins, thought, word, or deed. We lift up those who are bereaved, those who are suffering, and those who are in despair. And we ask that you give them your grace and your mercy. We love you, and we give, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We leave you now, Lord, but we leave, we separate from each other, Lord. But we ask you to be present with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you all. And we look to... Uh, engage in prayer this Thursday at 12 noon for our midday prayer period. Have a great rest of the night to meditate on chapter 4 and also read chapter 5. Listen, we're going to know the book of Genesis front and uh, before we finish studying it. Have a great rest of the night.